on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. Don't fight the way that you're wired just because somebody that you admire or something that you like is, you know, that little carrot in the sky. Like, let's cut the carrots down and look at ourselves and realign with who we are. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to The Self-Publishing Show, the second show of 2020. But actually, for me and you, Mark, this is kind of our first show of 2020, isn't it? Yes, it is, because we we blatched last year's shows. Um, so yes, this is the first one. As we get ready for the, as we pr- push on into the new year. We did some Blatch recording. Um, I'd forgotten that, <clears throat> I think it's Ernie Dempsey beca- took uh, Blatch on as an adjective. <laughs> I've been mm. Blatched, he said. <clears throat> did he? Mm. Did, did he sound like Captain Hook? Ah, he does. They do in the <laughs> South. Um, good. Well, look, we, uh, I hope you had a good Christmas and New Year. We can actually have that conversation now. We were just pretending before, weren't we? It's a happy new year. Now it is a happy new year. Did you have a good Christmas and New Year? You, um... Yes, Ooh. yes, and no. And um, if if you could uh, count taking my dad into hospital at one o'clock on uh, on the Monday after Christmas with a suspected heart attack, that could. Um, oh my yeah. goodness! <laughs> yeah, it's been very busy. Yes, yeah, so I had. Um, yeah, my dad had uh, had some kind of uh, chest pains, which is not unusual for him. He's had so many heart attacks; it's kind of like yeah, it's just just another heart attack. Um, so yeah, he was in Salisbury Hospital for about two and a half days, which was I can't tell you how much fun that was. Um, Wow. That was pretty depressing. Um, it was very, very busy. You had people on gurneys in the corridor outside A&E, um, and it was it was just, you know, very, very hectic. That was the NHS at breaking point. I saw that at, at kind of close quarters. Yeah, it is. I had friends who en- ended up in hospital uh, for n- less serious reasons, including our own Catherine Matthews, whose daughter ended up going mm. in. And I think the uh, the stories from our emergency rooms, as they call them in America, at this time of year when the bug hits... And everyone, I don't know what else. I guess it's just the illnesses and sickness. A lot of booze as well. I mean, uh, yes, I, yes. I remember I saw in the news the other day um, they were complaining that this was, you know, people calling ambulances because they're intoxicated and mm. which is charge them. They well, you, I think in that case there is an argument that they should so be charged. A credit card machine in the back of the mm. ambulance. Yeah. Um, well, in America, I suppose uh, you would you do that once. You get your bill for three and a half thousand dollars, and you'd think twice about getting so inebriated that you need an ambulance. <laughs> you probably Maybe would. There is yes, some. I mean, that's probably the only bit of a healthcare policy we could take away. Mm. Um, okay, well, I'm sorry to hear that, Mark. It's the sort of thing you don't put on your status updates, isn't it? In A and E with yes. Dad. Um, yeah, so I, I, I wasn't aware of that. <clears throat> okay, but otherwise, uh, I think I did see on your Facebook status update a very large new wagon arrived at uh, oh. Shea Dawson on Christmas Day. That's a horse box. Yes, I bought Lucy a horse box this year. So it's, uh, which I, I, I'm still working my uh, head around the terminology here, but you'd think a horse box would be something that you'd hitch to the back of your car, but n- no, that's a trailer. A oh. horse box is, is effectively um, a van that's been converted into something that can carry a couple of horses. So um, yes, that was my big surprise. It was quite challenging actually to present that in a way that was surprising and I, I kind of mm. bottled it in the end because it's you, you can't hide it it's, it's enormous um so there's a I live in the in the countryside you know in a fairly isolated spot and um I spoke to the owner of a, a stables a yard down the road from us and said do you mind if I leave this horse box in your car park for two days whilst until Christmas day and he was like no it's completely fine no problem I did it, left it there. They went to check on it at, at seven o'clock at night. It was pitch black. It wasn't insured. Um, I hadn't insured it. So uh, right. I was thinking if it gets nicked, yes. there's, nothing I can do. there's nothing I can do about it. <clears throat> so in the end, I, I decided it wasn't very romantic, but I kind of drove home, got the kids out of bed and said to Lucy, you're getting your Christmas present on the Monday, so the 23rd. So we drove back to the yard um, and she was quite surprised. So that was... It wasn't quite how I planned it, but it was still it was still effective. It was a good gift. Good. I got my wife a pair of Wellington boots. Oh, very nice. She was pleased. I got I some had Wellington those. boots. There you go. 
it's a great the gift that gives gives all winter <laughs> um good okay uh well here we are we're back on it um now for this year we've been doing a little bit of thinking and planning things we might spread out the course launches for 2020 give ourselves more chance to work on the content and make sure everything's in order so i think this year when we say this won't open again until next year we are going to be telling uh, absolutely the case will be the i think probably ads for authors might open Possibly once, once this year. Possibly once this year. So we'll see about that. We're doing some of that planning now. We're going to have a very busy year. We've got our first live conference in March. Uh, we will no doubt pitch up at some other conferences around the world yet to be decided. Uh, and we're going to bring on um, one important new course, which we're going to talk about in a moment. But before we do that, Mark, uh, I am going to welcome our Patreon supporters. I probably should have done this right at the top. But let me say a very warm welcome to those of you who've gone to patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show and pledged your support to the podcast in return for a plethora of goodies by the way uh, and that is robert m kearns from west virginia in the u.s from una medina olmsted uh phd and no, no, so dr una medina olmsted uh from new mexico and also marcy everest seth z herman Seth Z. Herman, probably says in America. Uh, Tanae Wilcox, I think that's how you pronounce it. T-N-A-E is the first name. And the T and N are capitals. Tanae Wilcox, I'm going to go with that. And Philip C. Thank you very much indeed. Now, one of the benefits you get from being a Patreon subscriber uh, is that you get invited to our exclusive training events, which uh, we're going to try and do more or less monthly. We've got a couple coming up in the near future, uh, including a really banging one, a banger, as the kids say. Oh, my on, God. On Instagram. Okay, Boomer, just let me talk. Um, on Instagram, uh, which is going to be it's so hot right now. That, that Instagram is so hot right now, to quote Zoolander. Oh, my God. Which is an old reference. Um, that's talking. coming up soon. And then we also have, uh, we're going to do blurbs again, I think, coming Dave, up. In those. Dave Chesson. And Dave Chesson is going to, yes, we're, we're uh, due an update on Dave's Gold Dust. So he did a really good talk. A slightly interrupted, but a really good talk at, um, at Nink last year. And we wanted to grab that and turn that into a training session for you. So hop along to patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show uh, to get your exclusive invites to those uh, live training events. I should say thank you for everyone who supports us on Patreon. Patreon because uh, <laughs> and occasionally I, we get some emails in, and um, I'm fairly I've got fairly thick skin now um, after doing this kind of stuff for such a long time. But I had one yesterday that was uh, asking for a refund on the ads course because the content was insufferably dull. <laughs> Ooh, <nice. laughs> that was one of my favourite ones ever. I think John uh, John Dyer flagged that to me and said, um, "Yeah." <laughs> well, and you, should, he's, you should sing sing your instruction john is john is so polite and, and answers everything i'm always yes. telling john you don't have to answer every email john answers emails from people who cold email us about selling us services that have nothing to do with publishing he'll say yes. very politely and uh, thank you very much for the, uh, the 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 lovely email <laughs> um we're not interested in that at the moment i mean obviously i'm not saying to john by, e by replying you've just confirmed that there is a person at the other end of the email you'll get more emails now <clears throat> But it doesn't make any difference. He says it's, it's, it's Catholic it's guilt, he says. Yes, it is. He can't leave them unanswered. Uh, and we're, we're grateful to him for that. Um, yes, well, look, the instruction in the course is not there necessarily to entertain, although most of the feedback we get back from people is that you're very easy to listen to and very clear. And I do ask that question when we do our testimonial interviews, ask how, how do people find the instruction? And uh, we get nothing but praise most of the time. Well, what, what we should also add, and it's kind of see, segueing back to your segue, was um, that that person who is now uh, withdrawn from the course and has been refunded will not get the uh, what we think will probably be the the best Amazon advertising course in the world. Um, they will so not. It's already pretty good, and that's with me as the uh, as the tutor. But we. Um, I don't know how much we mentioned on the podcast, but I have mentioned in the Facebook group, so we, we can say now that, um, and she will be listening, so I'm going to be nice. Um, but oh, we're always nice. We're always, well, we're always nice to everybody, but um, Janet Margot is um, someone I've known for a while now, must be five years or so now, and she um, she's worked um, at Amazon. She's an Amazonian, um, and I met her for the first time in Seattle in November, and she works, in fact, she has built the Amazon advertising platform for authors at Amazon. So she is a world, she is probably the person who knows the most about the Amazon advertising platform in the world. Um, and she's taught me lots of things. I and mean, I've got into some super secret beaters because um, Janet has got me in and she's helped me out now and again with questions that I've, I've had. 
and she is going to be the new tutor. I'm subject to, to you know, I's being dotted and T's crossed, but as far as we know at the moment, she's going to be the new tutor for the Amazon Ads course in the Ads for Authors course bundle. So anyone who is a student now, we're pretty sure we'll get that content for free. Uh, it will just be upgraded and, and you'll, you'll get uh, the course. And I've seen the curriculum and to, to quote, it's banging. Um, it will be it will be really, really good. Um, and we don't quite know how, how it will play out with regards to new students. It may be rolled into the course. It might be an optional extra. We're not quite sure yet, but it's going to be um, it's going to be fantastic. And it's the kind of thing that I'm really looking forward to because, I, you know, Janet, will be able to teach me things that I, I'm not aware of. So I can't wait to, to get that started as we push on into the rest of the year. Yeah, we're putting together the um, <clears throat> the legal stuff around it now. but uh, uh, And we should say, I think you did make it clear, but Janet has left Amazon only just so she's freshly no, out of the door. She's not left Amazon. Oh. She's moved into another another part of Amazon, uh, which is fairly un- not unusual for Amazonians, but she's just not working for Amazon advertising at the moment. Oh, I which, thought she was leaving Amazon completely. No, no. She's oh, going okay. to IMDb, which is owned by Amazon. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm with you. Oh, we should be good for film trivia knowledge as well. We could do well, a possibly, yes. Separate, separate module on that. Um, okay, excellent. So we're getting our heads down and working on that. We're going to have some standalone courses launched in 2020 as well. One uh, we previewed before. It's taken a long time actually to get it to the point of release, but that will be soon, which is how to write a bestseller, so formula on, particularly on um, sort of popular genre fiction books. And a course I'm very excited about working very closely um on how to revise a book with jenny nash uh which is a really good practical course that will it's all about everyone knows the how their approach to revising is but this is a really thorough system uh, and the sort of tagline of the course is going to be going from good to great how to get that book up a notch and that's looking really good as well so we're cracking on with those so as i say the reason it's going to be a very busy 2020 right now uh, we have a really good interview today. It's one we recorded in uh, Las Vegas in November at the 20 Books uh, Conference there. And this was a, a session, it was one of those sessions that uh, people walked out of at the previous conference at NINC and went on and on to us and said, you've got to get this this woman onto your podcast. And so... I thought you were uh, talking about have, me for a minute. Yeah, yours as well, obviously, but you are on the podcast. Oh yeah, that's notice. true. Yeah. Uh, so I reached out, as I said, to Becca Syme. Uh, in Vegas and said look let's see if we can sit down and, and I, I want to get the gist of what you taught in in uh, St. Petersburg because uh, and that was what really gripped people and it was this central message about how you go about uh, organizing yourself to get the the best out of yourself basically understanding your strengths and playing to them and some key sort of philosophical messages which are going to come out in this interview about the way that you do that and Becca's really thoughtful she's heads down in a lot of the psychology I guess is the right word of this uh, run by organizations like Gallup so she has these tests that they use uh, but she's gone one further and this is all based around writers as well this is a very specialist area for her so becca is going to be our interviewee today we'll hear from her now and then mark and i will be back for a chat off the back of that this is the self-publishing show there's never been a better time to be a writer becca yes. welcome to the self-publishing show thank you i'm happy Gr- to be here great to have you you are a hotly requested interviewee because uh <laughs> We were at NINC and unfortunately we don't get to go to all the sessions because we yeah. do this sort of thing in hotel rooms at conferences interviewing people. Yeah. And then uh, people just came out and said, uh, yours was one of the great sessions that they went to. So well done on that. Thank you. Um, and these conferences are always a little bit mixed. You know, some sessions people come out thinking they didn't get as much out of that as I'd hoped. Yours was not one of those sessions. So we oh, are going to you. talk to you about what you talked about to authors yeah. in that room, which is exciting. But first of all, I want to learn a bit about you. Yeah. So tell us who Becca Syme is. Um, well, I live in Montana, and I do write also fiction. I primarily, though, do coaching right now. I coach authors. Um, I am what I call a success coach. So it's looking at the barriers to success, and then how do we make you more successful than you are and get you towards the goals that you want? It's like alignment is what I call it, but it's really about how do we make you a successful standout, right? That's kind of what I talked about at Nink was like the standout writer, so yeah. Excellent, okay, well that's what we're gonna get into cool. um, in, in more detail. And how did you, what's your background to get you to that point? 
Uh, I have a master's degree in transformational leadership. And when I started doing that, I was uh, industrial and organizational uh, psychology, basically, right? So it was um, consulting and working with organizations, nonprofits, trying to figure out how to make them awesome at what they were, because I was a nonprofit leader. And so I was trying to figure out how to make my nonprofit awesome. And the technical term, I guess, awesome. Um, and I went to get coached at uh, for Strengths Finder, Gallup Strengths Finder. And I just, it was mind blowing. It was like uh, I walked in the room one person and walked out another person. And I decided I want to get trained how to do this. This is incredible. And I just sort of lost myself in learning about it. And then I just started coaching people whenever I could um, because I, I just, I love the program of figuring out how individual people can be their most successful. And uh, when I started writing fiction, I started coaching authors on the side, like for fun. And uh, it just kind of blossomed because there's so, there's so little information that's intuitive about who we are and how we could be successful. It really takes an outside perspective to do that kind of alignment. And so that's part of what the program did. And it just like, it, I love it. Yeah. And there's a difference between being a book coach and an author coach. You're, yes. not, you're not coaching people through the chapters of the book. No. You're coaching them to be better at what they're doing. Yep. Um, like processes. How do you make decisions as an author? How do you decide who to listen to? Um, how do you figure out when things don't work for you? Like if you take an ads class, right? And it doesn't work. How do you decide why it didn't work? And how do you know whether it's the person who's teaching you is not the right person for you to be listening to versus sometimes there's just not a way for you to personally get better at something that you have a challenge with. And so it's harder for people to do that naturally because we have this wiring that we want to assume that we're wrong, mm -hmm. that there's something wrong with us and we should fix ourselves. And sometimes that's so far from the truth that, um, so a lot of what I do is offer the perspective of, well, that's not what the pattern is. That's not what the success pattern is. Your success pattern is different from mine or from anybody's. And so it's all about, are you, um, are you working with the way that you could be the best? So no, I don't do any inside of novel stuff. Um, no, that's this definitely is, not me. <laughs> this is about us as authors. And yep. let, let me ask you a fundamental question. How, yeah. how important is this type of thinking, this type of logical thinking about your processes? For me, it's huge because there's too much of um, like emotions play a big role in how we assimilate information and how we evaluate what's right and wrong. And when we start thinking in our emotional, like limbic sort of brain, we're not thinking with our logical brain. And so some of the shift into being able to evaluate, like, is this really me or is it something else, is let's get out of that internal perspective for a second and look at an external perspective. And I'm not sure that we can make evaluative decisions about ourselves without some kind of shift like that because we get so insular. Um, so I just think it's totally necessary to have something, not this particular program, but something like it. Yeah. So there's an old expression that you can't see the woods for the yes. trees, isn't there? And that's sort of what we're talking that's about exactly here. exactly it. You're, you couldn't be closer to yourself than you. Yep, and, exactly. Uh, and I think some people do have that ability to step back and have that sort of oh, yeah. out of body experience where they're looking down at what they're doing, why they're doing it. Yeah. Most of us don't. No. And actually, that's a good point. That is a strength, right? Like in the, in the strengths finder assessment, the ability to have that analytical distance, that objective distance is a strength. And it's a very rare one. So not a lot of people, like maybe 15% of people have that capacity in an excellence level. So most people are not capable of doing this on their own. Yeah, that's a great point. So you'll sit down with somebody and do they come to you, I guess inevitably, probably come to you with stalled careers yeah. or less success than they want. Yep. Nobody comes to you and says, oh, I made another two yeah. million this year without even trying. Yes. So what, what's your process with them? So I bring them in to um, the test first. And it depends on which venue they come in. I do 
um, sort of productivity coaching as well, where we take a fuller 360 look and it's not just about how to stand out at something. Um, but when they come into like the Strengths for Writers program, they take the Clifton Strengths test and then I sit down and coach them with their results. Because there are, so the, the Strengths test itself is a psychometric that's meant to test how we're successful. So the way that it was developed was specifically that they studied 2 million people, like the best of the best in every field. And I mean like the best CEOs, the best housekeepers at Disneyland, okay. the best NBA basketball players, right? And they were interviewing to figure out what the success patterns look like. And they discovered that there was a very consistent pattern. And then they created this test to test for that pattern, right? So it was a very um, backwards process to the way that most psychometrics are created, which is me as an expert, look at the world, decide that there's four categories of people, and then create a test to fit people into that categories. This is the opposite, right? It's it data comes, driven. Yeah, it comes from success data, right? Which is what I love about it. Um, and so we sit down with that, and because there's proven patterns to the way success happens in your brain, you have specific strengths that nobody else has, or that um, other people don't have that particular combination. So I want to look at how do you fit the pattern and then how does the interconnection of your particular strength work in your favor, but then also how might it stand in your way. So like going back to the analytical, somebody who's overly objective might have issues being subjective when they need to, right? So like that's also one of the things that we talk about is what are the basement behaviors of that strength and how can we get you up out of that and then how can we take off from there? Yeah. And then do you face the challenge of people having to change themselves? Um, I mean, I would say there are behavior coaches that definitely have that. I don't, like, because of the way that the test was created, it's so consistent, the patterning, that it's like, don't fight your strengths. Don't try to be something that you're not because... There's a difference for me between capacity and success. You can absolutely have capacity in an area that you're never going to be a standout in. And so I'm like, let's ignore the areas where you are not strong and let's focus here because your capacity for development there is so much higher. And I would rather not try to work against patterns <laughs> because the process of changing your brain chemistry is very intensive. And I think that it's not, it's not always worth the effort that you put into it. So I'd rather work with the river than paddle yeah. against it. And I think that's such an important point. That, and this is, this is like the one takeaway that people kept quoting to yeah. me. They came out of your session at Nink and somebody, I was trying to get them to explain what you meant by it. And the way I understood it, tell me if I've got this right, is that if you're involved in a race car team and you roughly knew how the engine worked and you're quite interested in how the engine worked, but you're a brilliant driver, yeah. putting your effort into getting a little bit better at being a able mechanic. to do the engine yeah. is a waste of time compared yes. to the exponential, exponentially how better, much better you can get at being a driver because yep. you're already good at it. Yep. So being focusing on things you're already good at. Yes, exactly. And the, the, we do some math, right, in that um, discussion because if you think like my innate capacity is a one, and then I apply the time and intention training workshops, classes at a 10 level. So the best workshop you can get, there's a multiplication sign between those two. So if you multiply one times 10, you get 10, which out of 100 is the bottom 10% still. So I started off in the bottom 10% of my capacity. And this is basically what, what Gallup found, uh, what researchers found by doing these um, uh, experiments, right? about how does the time and intention work in, in comparison with your natural talent. So I'll tell you a quick story if that's okay. Sure. Um, so there were two groups of speed readers. This was a white paper that was done, I think by Indiana University, and so it's easily findable. There were two groups of speed readers. The average reader started off at uh, 90 words a minute, which is an, right in the middle of the average speed. And the above average group started off at 350. So already they were all naturally talented. Same speed reading class they went through. The people who were at 90 went to 150 at the end of this class. And the people who started off at 350 went to 3,000. 
So like not little, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's 10 times 10. So when you get to the place where you have a 10 natural capacity, you can add really excellent teaching and become top 1% because that's what 3,000 words a minute is for speed readers, right? It's the top 1% of reading speeds. So why spend time in your one to five talent areas when you could be at seven, eight, nine, ten, and be multiplying your capacity over and over and over and over again? And the speed reading is just one example of like one discrete skill but that kind of exponential growth capacity is consistent with all the strengths. And it's like, it's really, I mean, I've coached thousands of people in this program, 2,500 plus writers, like newbies, mid-listers, award winners, six and seven figure people. And it's consistent with everybody. Your highest areas of natural capacity times time and attention is exponential capacity growth from there. So yeah, it's like, yeah. Eyes bugging out, right? 3,000 words a minute. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. So what practical changes do you see authors making once they understand this? So some of the hugest ones are with people who are stuck currently with advice that they've been given about the author career that is just not working for them. Um, one of the biggest ones is you should write every day, right? right? So like I cannot tell you how many super successful people Obviously, we all get the like Stephen King, just close the door and write Nora Roberts eight hours a day, right? So people hear that and they think, okay, in order to be successful, then I need to write every day, eight hours a day, because that's what successful people do. Well, but do they? Right? Question the premise. So there is a strength called intellection where you process and process and process and process and then you spit out. So people who have high intellection who try to write every single day, they can't, no matter how hard they force themselves. And when they do force themselves to do it, they actually get a worse product at the end than if they had let themselves just think and think and think and then write, 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 write. So this experts giving them opinions, which are wonderful, great people trying to be helpful, but if you don't know how your brain works, you might try to make decisions that run opposite to your brain wiring that then make you not able to be successful at all. So what happens a ton when people have an election, they come into this class and they learn about it. All of a sudden, they decide to start thinking instead of forcing themselves to write. And we see like thousands and thousands more words produced in a very short amount of time where they might have been trying to write every single day previously and writing nothing. Like I have people who've written, you know, 3,000 words or something in six months and then they write 30,000 in a month because they allowed themselves to work with their natural process instead of fighting it. So like that's just one example, but there, I mean, there's, you know, thousands. It's amazing. And does it come down to practical changes like an author playing about with genres and, and wanting to write in a different genre, but yeah. struggling, but really wanting to overcome that instead yeah. of going back to what they're good at. Yep. That sort of decision making. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause there's also um, like innate abilities to do certain things in the plotting or in how you construct your narratives. For instance, there's um, high activators tend to have very little description and their books are very fast paced and they write short scenes and that kind of thing. So, Putting somebody like that in a genre like urban or epic fantasy, where you have 4,000 word chapters and super sweeping detail, and they're banging their head against the wall because they love Tolkien. And then you say, well, what if you wrote this instead? And then you could keep this natural ability that you have to write super short, punchy stuff because that's really well rewarded in genres like thriller, in genres like suspense. So like, don't fight. The way that you're wired just because somebody that you admire or something that you like is you know that little carrot in the sky like let's cut the carrots down and look at ourselves and realign with who we are yeah that's i get really passionate about yeah, this i'm like preach well you um <laughs> you speak very clear with great clarity about it so how does the process work with an author they come to you they do the clifford is it called the clifford test clifton strengths Clif yep. clifton sorry mm -hmm. the clifton strengths test yeah. uh and then you look at the results and what do you, how does that work from there? 
So because I've coached so many writers, there's certain patterns to how the writers use those strengths. And so what I did was I rewrote some of the material to be very specific to writers. So if you go and look at like the Gallup webcasts and stuff, you'll see the core strength uh, discussions that are very big picture. They're very corporate, right? Like they're more individualized, whereas all of my stuff is very specific to writers. How do writers use intellection, empathy? And so we talk about what the pattern is for success and then how closely you do or don't fit that pattern. So it's all coaching. Um, like my, my preference, I think, is always to do one-on-one -on -one coaching with people because how your specific strengths work together also changes like what you should be thinking, how you should be making choices. So it's all very one-on-one -on -one driven. And you do that presumably online and... Presumably. Yeah, like via Zoom or Skype, yeah. 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 And how to, uh, can I ask about the cost and what people, do you sort of set expectations and so on and how do people do this? Right, so the, I have a cohort that starts about once every couple of months I think now um, and so we grab a group of people together and they go through this, you get several one-on-ones in one month and the cost of the class is uh, $400 for the, for the course. So you get our materials and you get coached and then you get a development plan at the end. Because again, the exponential growth capacity is what I really like about it. So my goal is to get you not just understanding, but also developing. So like going from the base to better. Excellent. So how long have you been running these courses? Well, so the Strengths for Writers course for about two years, the Write Better Faster and that kind of like uh, personality alignment stuff. I mean, I think I started in 2014, and it really took off in 2016. Um, I had started doing some RWA chapters, uh, Romance Writers of America, and, uh, but so five, six years in total. But then I've been coaching since 2005, so almost 14 years now. And you just do authors? I do both now, again. Like oh, you I, say both? So both non-writers and okay, writers. Right. But, um, and we actually found that there are a lot of creatives that come in to the um, Strengths for Writers because they'll hear about it from a friend who's a writer. So we do screenwriters and poets and playwrights and songwriters and all that kind of stuff now too. Um, but we also do, because I have more coaches that work with me in the program now, we also do non-writers and we have a separate like uh, experience for non-writers. But I personally do almost 100% writers now because yeah. the demand is so great. And I think once people hear the message and they get excited about it, then they start talking to other people. So it kind of like multiplies. Yeah. And it's yeah. good to, cause, well, concentrating what yeah. you're good at, right? Yeah, so exactly. So practicing right? what you preach here. <laughs> yeah. And do you, well, I imagine these one-on-ones with authors, because people are complex beings, yeah. right? You probably end up as a bit of a psychoanalyst for, or yeah. a psychotherapist. A little for bit, yeah. Because it's, sometimes it's got to be, you'll be doing a one-on-one -on -one and understand that people have challenges in their yeah. home life and so on. Does it, does, yeah. Do you have to work to contain the scope of how you work with people? Or? Sometimes it depends on how um, excited they are about the goal that they have. So for instance, if somebody comes in with like, I want to write a million words this year, and then we start talking in their form, they fill out some stuff about like, how many books do you have out? How much time do you have? That kind of stuff. And I look at the material and it's like, oh, wow, you have a full-time job and three kids. Like, how are you going to make time for that? And so sometimes you have to address that stuff because it's getting in the way of their success. But I'm, my sister's a PhD in psychology. She's always telling me like, refer, refer, refer. Yeah. So anytime it gets to be therapeutic level, yeah. I'm like, I don't do therapy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a lot of success alignment is environmental. Like it's not only um, personality, but it's emotional. How does the neurobiology of your like fear receptors, how does that impact when you sit down to write? So some of it is like really, really complicated and which is why I have to do the one-on-ones because if I start talking to one person, I feel like I can really dig into like, wait, what did you just say? Oh, hang on, I heard that, right? Like that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. And we had a podcast interview recently with Sarah Painter uh, about anxiety oh, yeah. and writing. I thought she had some great advice of basically yeah. understanding anxiety and factoring it in. Yes. Rather than just having it there as a burden or challenge, it's yep. part of your process. Yes, exactly. It means things will take longer. Yep. And that's, I guess, I is, is good sort of advice. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. yeah. 
So how do people find you, Becca? How do they get on this, uh, this improvement train? Right. <laughs> so um, we have the test, obviously, that you can take. You can go to Gallup directly and take it. But because we're sort of amassing data on writers, I love to be able to have the writers take it through us. So if you go to betterfasteracademy.com, uh, there's the Strengths for Writers links and classes and stuff are there, but there's also a contact form. If anybody wants to take the test, contact us and we'll get you a code so you can be inside of our database and get that uh, connection. We also have a Facebook group that's just for people who've taken the Clifton Strengths test. It's called Strengths for Writers on Facebook. And we encourage people to come there because when you hear other people who have your strengths talk about how their process works, it's like, you're my people. Mm. Like, now I get why I do this. Um, and then I also have a YouTube channel where we talk with, like, successful writers. So I try to get three writers who have a particular strength. And I think the last one we did was restorative. And so we got three restorative writers. And then we interviewed them about, like, how does restorative work for you? What does this look like? So I'm trying to get as much free material out there as possible so people don't have to come and take the class. Um, and that's called the Quick Cast, Q U I T C H S T. Um, those are probably the three big ways. Yeah. yeah. Does it cost to take the test? It does. So it costs ten dollars to take it through us, um, just because we are trying to get everybody yeah. to come. But yeah. 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 And that would be very interesting for you to have the results for writers yeah. building up over time and yeah. start to look at that data. So yeah, that's literally how we can do the class because I've got twenty five hundred people you know, patterns behind me. And then in addition to the strengths finder data, um, just about success metrics. So yeah, there's a ton of benefit to coming and taking it through us so we can continue to serve writers better also in the future. Yeah. Great. And how you say we, are you a team now? Do you employ people? We are. Yeah. Like, we, I did not anticipate this happening, but um, so I have two coaches now currently who work with me. We're certifying a third one because they have to go to Gallup to get certified. Uh, we're certifying a third one in February and then hopefully a fourth one in April or March. Well, we'll see. And then we also have two assistants. And so, like, there's a big group of us at the Better Faster Academy, which is fun. We're a good community. Yeah. Sounds great. Um, we're here at Vegas, we should say, recording this in uh, at yeah. 20 Books Vegas. Are you speaking here? I did. I spoke last night. Okay. Yeah. I, spoke. I did a version of the standout writer stuff for romance writers, which was really fun. Great. Yeah. Well, I love the whole, uh, I mean, this is an amazing, uh, uh, rising tide raises all ships is the, yeah, is the yeah. motto for this conference. And yeah. um, the whole industry that's being created around yeah. Indies Ross, we should say there are some dark, dubious patches there of work yes. trying to cash in. Yeah. But there's also um, incredible services and, and, yeah. and bits and pieces that we need to do our jobs. And this is such yeah. an important part of that. And yeah. I imagine of, uh, of the areas people could invest in themselves, this is one that's give dividends. So. Huge, huge results. And that for me is, I think, the biggest thing. Even if you don't come to us to do it, learn where you can stand out, yep. especially when you're having um, resistance in areas. That is a big key that you need to get aligned, just like a spine, right? Like you go to the chiropractor to align your spine, you go to a coach to align your yourself, right? So huge, huge for the industry. I just have to find something I'm good at so I can concentrate <laughs> on it. Not right. Not writing Not books. writing books. Quite good at napping. <laughs> Maybe podcast My strength, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Becca, it's been really fun talking to you and it's uh, lived up every bit to my oh, expectations because you okay. came highly recommended. Oh, so good. thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a blast. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go. So Mark, I thought the central message, which I really liked, which people told me about in, uh, in Nink, was that uh, don't do what you're half half-hearted about or half good at do a lot of what you're good at and she showed a couple of graphs which we talked about in this interview there that people who are not very good at something when they really try to improve they kind of go up here and when they're really good at something and they try to improve they go even further up you go the exponential is is greater uh, so you improve at things you're good at and that kind of makes sense when you say it out loud because you're obviously good at them for a reason. There's an aptitude, there's an enthusiasm for it, and you're only going to go so far with the bits of business that you don't like. So working out what to outsource, working out what to do less of, working out what to do more of is going to make, for some people, I think, a significant difference to their output in 2020.
What would you do if you like everything? Do you like everything? Uh, yeah, pretty much. I, I, don't, I mean, I'm, it's, I don't like being as busy as I am, but um, mm. but no, there's nothing I don't dislike. I don't think. I think there's some things you don't. I know what you dislike. You just like things like uh, the administration of accounts and yes, insurance and all the business stuff yes, you don't like. I do. I, I'm not good at that. I certainly don't enjoy that. Um, Wills. Well, that's well, your son. <laughs> you don't like him. I don't like your son. No, um, no. You don't like, we had a conversation once about writing wheels, and you told we? me I hate all that stuff. You said, "Did I? Are you yeah, sure I it was? So, sure it was Mark? You say to the cricket? <laughs> That's right. You confuse with my other friend, um, No, I, well, um, no one likes wheels. I mean, I've 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 done the will. I mean, I don't do it myself, obviously. Um, but I've, I've sorted out our wills ages ago. Um, but no. All right. Well, so so yes. I mean, I'm a bit like you. I'm a bit of a polymath. I think. I think I can, and you probably know that about me now because you've thrown quite a few things my way that I had no experience of at all before we met, and have become. I've sort of embraced them and become quite good at. And I enjoy that. I do worry a bit about myself. Is like a lot of people. There's that initial enthusiasm for something, and then sometimes it plateaus a bit. So I have to work on making sure that I'm still improving on areas. Mm-hmm. Um, I bit of a hard taskmaster on myself I suspect you are as well mm-hmm. That's the, again the kind of religious guilt thing I don't know you always should be working harder um but yeah but I think for some people there they are in a they don't take a helicopter view of what they're doing and how they're doing stuff and I think that's what Becca's main thing is is un- first of all understand your strengths and weaknesses then look at everything you're doing and critically analyze it in the same way we talk about distancing ourselves from our books when we do the marketing treat those products you have to do that about your workflow the way you run your business as well um i found it very useful fascinating and becca's really become a master of that stuff and um she mentioned it in the uh, podcast interview let me bring it across here but she does have that uh, website you can go to and do the uh, the gallup test uh, which is betterfasteracademy.com and what i might do with becca because i think there's more that we can explore there with her um, over the next year is we'll potentially get her to I don't know possibly write a book for us or um, you know webinars or some sort of um, some help that we can hand out that's going to be useful to people a sort of blueprint for getting this stuff right so we'll mm. keep in touch with Becca for sure yeah my view on that is um, I, I, I'm looking at this at the moment I read an interesting post by Joseph Alexander on the 20 books group so he's a, a friend of the show been on once or twice um, sells a lot of non-fiction books Joseph um, has outsourced a lot of the, the stuff he doesn't want to do. Um, and this isn't something he's come up with, but he before he outsourced it, he sat down for a day or two and wrote down everything that he did. everything, Every single thing that he did, he noted down uh, what it was and probably how long he spent doing it. And then he had a had a good idea of where his, t- where his time was being spent. And then he outsourced the things that either he didn't want to do, um, or for me, I would outsource the things that it didn't make financial sense for me to do. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I know roughly how much my time is worth, and I know where I get I get the most return from writing new books or from um, course material, you know, that kind of creative stuff. That's where I, I think I generate most of my value, and I probably don't get most of my value from um, email correspondence um, or admin it doesn't make much sense for someone in, in, in my position to spend a lot of time admi- doing administration. You can hire people for that. Uh, and that's kind yeah. of, I'm kind of I'm looking at that this year. Something that I'd like to do is to hand off some of the stuff that I still do myself. Um, you know, I'd love to hand off Facebook ads, but I haven't found anybody who I think could do it without bigging myself up too much, can do it better than I can for my books. Um, mm. But, you know, keep my eyes open. Um, I don't think I'm going to find anyone at work who can do that for me. But if someone uh, comes across my radar and I think I might be interested in, in trying something with them, you know, who knows, maybe I'll try that. Yeah, this is a separate subject, but that's an interesting area, the outsourcing of social media ads. Can I keep an eye on this? And I've got, there's people around here who do it. And there's a lot, you know, there's agencies of 10 a penny that will run mm. campaigns for Rubbish. you. Rubbish. And they are rubbish. And I look at them and they, they go on and on about how many impressions they got on a, on a campaign as if that's some sort of mark of success. It's probably just badly targeted. Yeah, I, way, way back. Everyone. I had a, I, I, just before, as we started SPF, I had engaged the campaign to do my social media ads. I won't name them, but they're in Chester. So they're easy to find. And they were terrible, absolutely mm. terrible. And the problem that they had was I knew enough in fact, I knew more than enough. I probably knew more than they did about Facebook ads, but I could certainly see that they didn't know what they were talking about. Um, and they, you know, they, they were terrible. And so I basically 
nix that Im- immediately. Um, and yeah. I've never really tried to, to find anybody else. But obviously, we've got Deepesh who helps us with the SPF yeah. side, and he is he and his team are excellent. Um, but they are, and it gets it gets expensive suddenly. So you get to that mm. that few people. We had a conversation in the summer, didn't we, with with somebody else who potentially might might have helped us. But the opening the opening mm-hmm. price point when you get somebody at a one to one who does know what they're talking about, even if you maybe weren't convinced they were going to be good for us. They mm. are talking. They are normally talking of ten thousand dollars yeah. a month plus. Yeah, yeah, and also my BS detector basically exploded. Um, so, no, know, it first, might have been good. first impressions are impor- quite important for me, and I, he he did not he did not have a very good first impression. No, well, he didn't get off the starting blocks. He us, did so. not. <clears throat> uh, we're very happy. We love uh, working with uh, Depeche Mandelia. It's been uh, excellent. He's a bit of a guru himself, um, mm. and does some workshops and books and stuff. So, if you want, yeah, to see he's great. Out. Yeah. Yep. Good. Okay. Well, look, I think that's it for our second podcast of the uh, of the new year. We are uh, we had a meeting this morning. A sort of long list of SPS Live stuff is happening in the background. Um, that's all coming soon. We've got a site visit coming up in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I just got an email from Amazon this morning about that as well. So, um, yes. okay. Hi. <laughs> What's going on, Mark? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> give, give me a couple of days. <laughs> it's all happening now it's going to time is going to race past um, we're suddenly going to be standing live in front of the audience at the queen elizabeth hall uh, we should say at this stage if you um first of all if you haven't been able to get a ticket we are going to be releasing another batch of tickets soon so make sure you get on that wait list if i can remember what it is it's self-publishing show dot uh, sorry self-publishing formula.com uh, forward slash sps live wait list or one word get yourself on the wait list we're going to be emailing out soon um, the second thing to say is we will be recording everything and we are going to package everything up and probably to cover the cost of the uh, hiring a production company to do all of this, there'll be a charge, but it'll be a smallish charge for access to all the sessions at our teachable school and there'll be hours of content there. Uh, we think that's probably what's going to happen. Um, yes, good. Excellent. That's it. Anything else to say? You, did you, did you arrive in the horse box and park it in? You probably can't get into the multi-story though, can you? No, no, I'm going to get. I'm going to drive the horse box. I have driven it in its uninsured state. Don't tell anybody, but I drove it from the one yard to to the house, and then and then on the twenty third, with the dog running around, two kids who are tired and want to go to bed, I had to reverse this this enormous horse box <laughs> between into into our garden between uh, the two two gate posts through the gates, and it was very tight. It was right. it was like inches, um, but I'm quite surprised I didn't because I'm not the best in the world at reversing enormous um, vehicles like that. And it was it was it was pretty close, but we just about managed it. Good. Okay. Well, look, I'll leave you to have some reversing fun and become uh, an expert at that, like everything else that you touch. <laughs> um, good. Thank you very much. We're running out of time on these uh, on these tapes. Uh, that's it for this week. We've got a few. Uh, actually, we've just scheduled our next few podcasts. We've got some good ones coming up. Uh, let's see if I can. Uh, good one. Yes, good one. Uh, next week, which is Johnny True. We haven't had Johnny B. Truant on for a long time. It's a really good catch up with Johnny and an excellent book that they've just come up with, uh, which they're launching. So you're going to hear all about that next week. Until then, though, it only leaves me to say that it's a goodbye from him and a goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.